Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I will be your reader today. Perception. Perception. Perception is an odd part of the human experience, I think. What we perceive in one moment may well change with the turn of a head, or then a second look, a different light, another moment. Even though we might perceive that the dark January clouds approaching from the west may well forebode snow or rain within minutes, Another turn of the head moments later may bring on a very different perception and a subconscious conclusion. Animals perceive as well, from elephants to spaniels to blowfish, especially their sense and perception of danger. But the most intriguing perception dilemma I think we face as humans in our perceptions and oftentimes our unfounded conclusions about others. There is, of course, the ages old adage about not judging a book by its cover. Perception without exploration can easily become an unfortunate trap. The shadow of perception can completely blur the light of reality. A few years back, I found myself basking in the joy of traveling by train the 4,543 kilometers, 2,822 miles, across North Africa from Cairo to Casablanca. The dream was on the bucket list. The journey passed through and paused often from Egypt through Libya, Tunisia, and Algeria before reaching around the great Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Of course, when one is a foreigner in a foreign land, Tis wise to depend on the powers of all five senses to absorb the richness of each moment of the experience while being sharply tuned in to everything and everyone around you, the radar dial on high. From the first departing whistle in Cairo, I noticed a distinguished gentleman, a few years younger, entering the private cabin next to mine. I paid little attention, but over time, in the dining and the observation cars, I perceived there was something oddly private and silent about him, as well as a bit disheveled and well, seemingly absent-minded. I avoided him based on my perceptions. Oddly, I noted, however, that he changed trains each time I did and seemed to be on the same cross-continent journey as was I. Well, by the time we reached Tunis, my curiosity won over and I approached him with some trepidation to uh, inquire about the book he was reading, which he carried under his arm though I never saw him read it. <laughs> Thus, a conversation began. A conversation that continued, except for nighttime retreats, all the way to Casablanca. My perceptions had been terribly wrong. Abu Bakr Imhopt, meaning he comes in peace in Egyptian, remains a friend to this day. Our paths have crossed at the wedding of his daughter in Marrakesh, my retirement from the international hotel business in London, and at the funeral of his highly respected scholar father in Cairo. Today's book in the spotlight is, to a great extent, about perceptions. 
As the cavalcade of characters strolls through life in the village of Crosby on Maine's mid coast, perceptions sway like the birch trees in a summer breeze and discoveries of misperception unfold in every chapter of the book. Pulitzer Prize winning author Elizabeth Strout is the brilliant storyteller. And the name of the book is simply that of the leading character, Olive Kittredge. But before exploring the story told, let us consider some facts about the author. Elizabeth Strout is and has been on a fast track as an award-winning author since penning her first novel, Amy and Isabel, in 1998. The novel was immediately shortlisted for the 2000 Orange Prize and nominated for the 2000 Penn Faulkner Award for fiction. First book. <laughs> From her formative years in Portland to her college years at Bates College to her move to New York City to pursue her dream, Elizabeth Strout seems to never have been not writing. I quote her here, I wanted to be a writer so much that the idea of failing at it was almost unbearable to me. I really didn't tell people as I grew older that I wanted to be a writer, you know, because they look at you with such looks of pity. I just couldn't stand that. <laughs> End of quote. Somehow in the midst of the pursuit of her goal, Stroud studied law at Syracuse University and practiced for six months. She then taught part-time at Borough of Manhattan Community College and was a national endowment for the humanities lecturer at Colgate University. She was also on the faculty of the Master of Fine Arts program at Queens University of Charlotte in Charlotte, North Carolina. When, oh when, did she find the time to write, one wonders. Well, write she did. And her first leap from the gate with Amy and Isabel in 1998 was the first day of the best part of her life. Following a second round of applause for her second book, Abide in Me, With Me, in 2006, it was novel number three, two years later, that earned her the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 2009. To date, Six brilliant novels, including one that you know well, My Name is Lucy Barton, have followed in the past of the first three, and Elizabeth Strout need no longer worry about being a failure. My Name is Lizzie Barton, published in 2016, did top the New York Times bestseller list, was also long listed for the Man Booker Prize, Britain's most coveted literary award, and was adapted to a play off Broadway, which was terrific. Elizabeth Strout divides her time between New York City and Brunswick, Maine. I sincerely doubt that looks of pity ever now come her way. Elizabeth Stroud is a main nurtured star in today's literary firmament. Olive Kittredge, the Pulitzer Prize book, winning book, is a uniquely structured book in that it revolves around its leading character and title role, Olive Kittredge. It's also unique in that the book features a collection of 13 connected short stories about a woman and her immediate family and friends on the coast of Maine. And the wide range of perceptions about Olive Kittredge are nearly always transformed as each story unfolds. 
Emily Nussbaum of the uh, New Yorker called the short stories taciturn and elegant. At times stern, at other times patient, at times perceptive, at other times in sad denial, Olive Kittredge, a retired school teacher, deplores the changes in her little town of Crosby, Maine, and in the world at large. But she doesn't always recognize the changes in those around her. A lounge musician haunted by a past romance, a former student who has lost the will to live, Olive's own adult child, Christopher, who feels tyrannized by her irrational sensitivities and her husband, Henry, who finds his loyalty to his marriage, both a blessing and a curse. As the townspeople grapple with their problems, mild and dire, Olive is brought to a deeper understanding of herself and her life sometimes painfully, but always with ruthless honesty. All of Kittredge offers profound insights into the human condition, its conflicts, its tragedies and joys, and the endurance it requires. Louisa Thomas, who writes for the New York Times said, Quote, the pleasure in reading all of Kittredge comes from an intense identification with complicated, not always admirable, characters. And there are moments in which slipping into a character's viewpoint seems to involve the revelation of an emotion more powerful and interesting than simple fellow feeling. A complex, sometimes dark, sometimes life-sustaining dependency on others. There's nothing mawkish or cheap here. There's simply the honest recognition that we need to go beyond perception and try to understand people, even if we can't stand them. In addition to garnering the Pulitzer Prize, Olive Kittredge was named one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, USA Today, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Chicago Tribune, People Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Atlantic. In 2014, HBO produced a four-part miniseries from the book starring Francis McDormand as Olive Kittredge. And at the 67th Prime Time Emmy Awards, the miniseries won eight awards, including outstanding limited series. In my humble opinion, well, what more can be said? <laughs> Reading all of Kittredge with Elizabeth Strout's brilliantly drawn characters, covers a span of 24 years, not the reading, but the book in small town Crosby, Maine, and was for me a journey about how hard it is ever to know anyone, including ourselves. It is also a story where perceptions of the people around us change as efforts to connect produce new and rich relationships. The book is a gem of a reading experience. And of Elizabeth's 13 chapters through which Olive Kittredge moves, she's the only one who moves through all 13 chapters. Maybe her husband does as well, but I think not. I've chosen one a bit into the book, actually, uh, since they are rather like short stories and do stand alone. Uh, I was uh, making sure I was aware of that as I was reading it. Um, I'm going to start way up on page 61, and it's called, uh, this chapter, it's called A Little Burst. And uh, the only thing I want to tell you is I mentioned Christopher earlier, and Christopher is uh, Olive and Henry's son. 
And this is the story of his wedding, but it's more to focus on Olive uh, than it is actually on the bride and the groom. So a little burst from Olive Kittredge. Three hours ago, while the sun was shining full tilt through the trees and across the back lawn, the local podiatrist, a middle-aged man named Christopher Kittredge, was married to a woman from out of town named Suzanne. This is the first marriage for both of them, and the wedding has been a smallish, pleasant affair with a flute player and baskets of yellow sweetheart roses placed inside and outside the house. So far, the polite cheerfulness of the guests seems to show no sign of running down, and Olive Kittredge, standing by the picnic table, is thinking it's really high time everybody left. All afternoon, Olive has been fighting the sensation of moving underwater, a panicky, dismal feeling, since she has somehow never managed to learn to swim. Wedging her paper napkin into the slats of the picnic table, she thinks, all right, I've had enough, and dropping her gaze so as to avoid getting stuck in one more yakety conversation, she walks around to the side of the house and steps through a door that opens directly into her son's bedroom. Here she crosses the pine floor, gleaming in the sunshine, and lies down on Christopher's and Suzanne's queen-size bed. Olive's dress, which is important to the day, of course, since she is the mother of the brave groom, is made from a gauzy green muslin with big reddish pink geraniums printed all over it. And she has to arrange herself carefully on the bed so it won't wind up all wrinkly. And also in case someone walks in, so she will look decent. Olive is a big person. She knows this about herself, but she wasn't always big and it still seems something to get used to. It's true she has always been tall and frequently felt clumsy, but the business of being big showed up with age. Her ankles, ankles puffed out, her shoulders rolled up behind her neck, and her wrists and hands seemed to become the size of a man. Olive minds, of course she does. Sometimes privately, she minds very much. But at this stage of the game, she is not about to abandon the comfort of food. And that means right now she probably looks like a fat, dozing seal wrapped in some kind of gauze bandage. But the dress worked out well, she reminds herself, leaning back and closing her eyes. Much better than the dark, grim clothes the Bernstein family is wearing as though they had been asked to a funeral instead of a wedding on this bright June day. The inside door of her son's bedroom is partly open and voices and sounds make their way from the front of the house where the party is also going on. High heels clicking down the hallway, a bathroom door pushed aggressively shut. Honestly, Olive thinks, why not just close a door nicely? A chair in the living room gets scraped over the floor and in there with the muted laughter and talk is the odor of coffee and the thick sweet smell of baked goods, which is the way the streets near the Nissen bread factory used to smell before it closed down. There are different perfumes as well including one that all day has smelled to Olive like that bug spray, off. All these smells have managed to move down the hall and drift into the bedroom. Cigarette smoke, too. Olive opens her eyes. Someone is smoking a cigarette in the back garden. Through the open window, she hears a cough, the click of a lighter. Really, the place has been overrun. She pictures heavy shoes stepping through the gladiola bed, and then, hearing a toilet flush down the hall, she has a momentary image of the house collapsing, 
pipes breaking, floorboards snapping, walls folding over. She sits up slightly, rearranges herself, and puts another pillow against the headboard. She built the house herself. Well, almost. She and Henry, years ago, did all the design and then worked closely with the builder so that Chris would have a decent place to live when he came back from podiatry school. When you build a house yourself, you're going to you are going to have a different feeling about it than other people do. Olive is used to this because she has always liked to make things: dresses, gardens, houses. The yellow roses were arranged in their baskets by her this morning before the sun was up. Her own house, a few miles down the road, she and Henry also built years ago. And just recently, she fired the cleaning woman because of the way the foolish girl dragged the vacuum cleaner across the floor, banging it into walls and bumping it down the stairs. At least Christopher appreciates this place. Over the last few years, the three of them, Olive and Henry and Christopher have taken care of it together, clearing more woods, planting lilacs and rhododendrons, digging post holes for the fence. Now, Suzanne, Dr. Sue, is what Olive calls her in her head, will take over. And coming from money, the way she does, she will probably hire a housekeeper, as well as a gardener. <laughs> Love your pretty nasturtions, Dr. Sue said to Olive a few weeks ago, pointing to the petunia rose. But never mind, Olive thinks now. You move aside and make way for the new. Through her closed eyes, Olive sees a red light slanting through the windows. She can feel sunlight warming her calves and ankles on the bed, can feel beneath her hand how it warms the soft fabric of her dress, which really did come out nicely. It pleases her to think of the piece of blueberry cake she managed to slip into her big leather handbag, how she can go home soon and eat it in peace, take off this panty girdle, get things back to normal. Olive senses someone in the room and opens her eyes. A small child stands staring from the doorway, one of the bride's little nieces from Chicago, it's the one who was supposed to sprinkle rose petals on the ground right before the ceremony, but at the last minute decided she didn't want to and hung back, sulking. Dr. Sue was nice about it, though, speaking reassuringly to the little girl, cupping her hand gently around the child's head. Finally, Suzanne called out good-naturedly, Oh, go ahead to a woman standing near a tree who started playing a flute. Then Suzanne walked over to Christopher, who was not smiling, looking as stiff as driftwood, and the two stood there getting married on the lawn. But the gesture, the smooth cupping of the little girl's head, the way Suzanne's hand in one quick motion caressed the fine hair and thin neck, has stayed with Olive. It was like watching some woman dive from a boat and swim easily up to the dock. A reminder how some people could do things, others could not. Hello, Olive says to the little girl, but the child does not reply. After a moment, Olive says, how old are you? She is no longer familiar with young children, but she guesses this one is around four, maybe five. Nobody in the Bernstein family seems tall. Still, the child says nothing. Run along now, Olive tells her. But the girl leans against the door jamb and sways slightly, her eyes fixed on Olive. Not polite to stare, Olive says. Didn't anyone teach you that? The little girl, still swaying, says calmly, you look dead. Olive lifts her head up. Is that what they teach you to say these days? 
but she feels a physical reaction as she leans back down, a soft ache beating in her breastbone for a moment, like a wing inside her. The child ought to have her mouth washed out with soap. Anyway, the day is almost over. Olive stares up at the skylight over the bed and reassures herself that she has apparently lived through it. She pictured herself having another heart attack on the day of her son's wedding. She would be sitting on her folding chair on the lawn, exposed to everyone, and after her son said, I do, she would silently, awkwardly fall over dead, with her face pressed into the grass and her big hind end with the gauzy geranium print stuck up in the air. People would talk about it for days to come. What are those things on your face? Olive turns her head toward the door. Are you still there? I thought you'd gone away. There's a hair coming out of one of those things on your face, the child says, bolder now, taking a step into the room. The one on your chin. Olive turns her gaze back to the ceiling and receives these words without an accompanying wing beat in her chest. Amazing how nasty kids are these days. And it was very smart to put that skylight over the bed. Chris has told her how in the winter sometimes he can lie in bed and watch it snow. He's always been like that. A different kind of person. Very sensitive. It was what made him an excellent oil painter, though such a thing was not usually expected of a podiatrist. He was a complicated, interesting man, her son. So sensitive as a child that once, when he was reading Heidi, he painted a picture to illustrate it, some wild flowers on an alpine hillside. What is that on your chin? Olive sees that the little girl has been chewing on a ribbon from her dress. Crumbs, Olive says from little girls I'd eaten up. Now go away before I eat you too. And she makes her eyes big. The girl steps back slightly, holding the door jam. You're making that up, she finally says, but she turns and disappears. <sighs> About time, Olive murmurs. Now she hears the sound of high heels, clattering, unevenly down the hallway. Looking for the little girl's room, a woman's voice says, and Olive recognizes the voice of Janice Bernstein, Suzanne's mother. Henry's voice answers, oh, right there, right, right there. Olive waits for Henry to look into the bedroom, and in a moment he does. His big face is shiny with the affability that comes over him in large groups of people. You all right, Ollie? Shh. Shut up. I don't need anyone knowing I'm in here. He steps farther into the room. You are right. I'm ready to go home. Though I expect you want to stay until the last dog dies. Don't I hate a grown woman who says the little girl's room. Is she drunk? Oh, I don't think so, Ollie. They're smoking outside there. Olive nods toward the window. I hope they don't set the place on fire. They won't. Then after a moment, Henry says, everything went well, I think. Oh, sure, you go say your goodbyes now so that we can get going. He's married a nice woman, Henry said, hesitating by the foot of the bed. Yes, I think he has. They're silent for a moment. It is a shock after all, their son, their only child, married now. He is 38 years old. They'd gotten pretty used to him. The unexpected at one point that he would marry his office assistant, but that didn't last very long. Then it seemed that he would marry the teacher who lived out on Turtleback Island, but that didn't last long either. Then it happened, right out of the blue, Suzanne Bernstein, MD, PhD, showed up in town for a conference and trotted around all week in a new pair of shoes. 
The shoes inflamed an ingrown toenail and caused a blister the size of a big marble to appear on her soul. Suzanne was telling the story all day. I looked in the yellow pages and by the time I got to his office, I had ruined my feet. He had to drill through a toenail. Oh, what a way to meet. Olive found the story stupid. Why hadn't the girl with all her money simply bought a pair of shoes that fit? However, that was how the couple met. And the rest, as Suzanne was saying all day, was history. If you call six weeks history, because that part was surprising as well. To get married quick as a thunderclap. Why wait, Suzanne said to all of the day, as she and Christopher stopped by to show off the ring. Olive said agreeably, no reason at all. Still, Henry, Olive says now, how come a gastroenterologist? Plenty of other kinds of doctors to be without all that poking around. You don't like thinking about it. Henry looks at her in his absent way. I know it. Sunlight flickers on the wall and the white curtains move slightly. The smell of cigarette smoke returns. Henry and Olive are silent, gazing at the foot of the bed until Olive says she's a very positive person. But she's good for Christopher, Henry says. They have been almost whispering, but at the sound of footsteps in the hallway, both of them turn toward the half open door with perky, pleasant expressions on their faces. Except that Suzanne's mother doesn't stop. She goes right on past in her navy blue suit holding a pocketbook that looks like a miniature suitcase. You better get back out there, Olive says. I'll come say my goodbyes in a minute. Just give me a second to rest. Yes, yes, you rest, Olive. How about we stop at Dunkin' Donuts, she says. They like to sit in the booth by the window and there's a waitress who knows them. She'll say hi nicely, then leave them alone. We can do that, Henry says, at the door. Lying back against the pillow, she thinks how pale her son was, standing there getting married. In his guarded Christopher way, he looked gratefully at his bride, who stood thin and small-breasted, gazing up at him. Her mother cried. It was really something. Janice Bernstein's eyes positively streaming. Afterwards, she said to Olive, don't you cry at weddings? I don't see any reason to cry, Olive said. Weeping would not have come close to what she felt. She felt fear. Sitting out there on her folding chair, fear that her heart would squeeze shut again, would stop the way it did once before, a fist punched through her back. And she felt it, too, at the way the bride was smiling up at Christopher as though she actually knew him. <laughs> because did she know what he looked like in first grade when he had a nosebleed in Miss Lampley's class? Did she see him when he was a pale, slightly pudgy child, his skin broken out in hives because he was afraid to take a spelling test? No. What Suzanne was mistaking for knowing somebody was knowing sex with that person for a couple of weeks. You never could have told her that, though. If Olive had told her that the nasturtians were actually petunias, of which she did not do, Dr. Sue might have said, well, I've seen nasturtians that look just like that. But still... It was disconcerting how Suzanne looked at Christopher while they were getting married as though saying, I know you. Yes, I do. I do. All of can understand why Chris has never bothered having many friends. He's like her that way. Can't stand the blah, blah, blah. And there's just as soon blah, blah, blah about you when your back is turned. Never trust folks. Olive's mother told her that years ago, after someone left a basket of cow flaps by their front door. Henry got irritated by that way of thinking, but Henry was pretty irritating himself with his steadfast way of remaining naive, 
as though life were just what a Sears catalog told you it was. Everyone standing around, smiling. Still, all of herself had been worried about Christopher's being lonely. She was especially haunted this past winter by the thought of her son's becoming an old man. Returning home from work in the darkness after she and Henry were gone. Excuse me. <coughs> so, she is glad, really, about Suzanne. It was sudden, and will take getting used to, but all things considered, Dr. Sue will be fine. And the girl has been perfectly friendly to her. I can't believe you did the blueprints yourself. Blonde eyebrows raised sky high. Besides, Christopher, let's face it, is gaga over her. Of course, right now, their sex life is probably very exciting, and they undoubtedly think that will last the way new couples do. They think they're finished with loneliness, too. This thought causes Olive to nod her head slowly as she lies on the bed. She knows that loneliness can kill people in different ways, can actually make you die. Olive's private view is that life depends on what she thinks of as big bursts and little bursts. Big bursts are things like marriage or children, intimacies that keep you afloat, but these big bursts hold dangerous unseen currents, which is why you need the little bursts as well. A friendly clerk at Bradley's, let's say, or the waitress at Dunkin' Donuts who knows how you like your coffee. Tricky business, really. Nice spot Suzanne's getting here, says one of the deep voices outside the window. Heard very clearly, they must have shifted their feet around now, facing the house. Great spot, says the other voice. We came up here when I was a kid and stayed at Speckled Egg Harbor, I think, something like that. Polite men having their cigarettes, just keep your feet off the glads, Olive thinks, and don't burn down that fence. She is sleepy, and the feeling is not unpleasant. She could take a nap right here if they'd give her 20 minutes, then go make her rounds and say goodbye, clear-headed and calm from a little sleep. She will take Janice Bernstein's hand and hold it at a moment. She will be a gracious, gray-haired, pleasantly large woman in her soft, red-flowered dress. A screen door slams. The emphysema brigade comes Suzanne's bright voice and the clapping of her hands. Olive's eyes flip open. She feels a jolt of panic as if she herself has just been caught smoking in the woods. Do you know those things will kill you? Oh, I've never heard that, the man says jovially. Suzanne, I don't think I've ever heard that before. The screen door opens and closes again. Someone has gone in. Olive sits up, her nap spoiled. Now a softer voice comes through the window. That skinny little friend of Suzanne's, Olive thinks, whose dress looks like a piece of wrapped seaweed. You holding up okay? Yeah, Suzanne draws the word out somehow, enjoying the attention, Olive thinks. So, Susie, how do you like your new in-laws? Olive's heart goes beat, beat as she sits on the edge of the bed. It's interesting, Suzanne says, her voice lowered and serious. Dr. Sue, the professional, about to give a paper on intestinal parasites. Her voice drops and Olive can't hear. Um, I can see that, murmur, murmur, murmur. The father, oh, Henry's a doll. Olive stands up and very slowly moves along the wall closer to the open window. A shaft of the late afternoon sun falls over the side of her face, 
as she strains her head forward to make out words and the sounds of the women's murmuring. Oh, God, yes, says Suzanne, her quiet words suddenly distinct. I couldn't believe it. I mean, that she would really wear it? The dress, Olive thinks. She pulls herself back against the wall. Well, people dress differently up here. By God, we do, Olive thinks, as she has stunned in her underwater way. Seaweed friend murmurs again. Her voice is difficult to make out, but Olive hears her say, Chris. Ooh, very special, Suzanne answers seriously. And for Olive, it is as if these women are sitting in a rowboat above her while she sinks into the murky water. He's had a hard time, you know. And being an only child, that really sucked for him. Seaweed murmurs, and Suzanne's oar slices through the water again. The expectations, you know. Olive turns and goes slowly around the room, her son's bedroom. She built it. And there are familiar things in here, too, like the bureau and the rug she braided a long time ago. But something stunned and fat and black moves through her. He's had a hard time, you know. Almost crouching, Olive creeps slowly back to the bed where she sits down cautiously. What did he tell Suzanne? A hard time? Underneath her tongue, back up by her molars, Olive's mouth begins to secrete. She pictures fleetingly again how Suzanne's hand so easily gently cupped that little girl's head. What had Christopher said? What had he remembered? A person can only move forward, she thinks. A person should only move forward. And there is the state sting of deep embarrassment because she loves this dress. Her heart really opened when she came across the gauzy, mus gauze, gauzy muslin, muslin at Sofro's. Sunlight led into the anxious gloom of the upcoming wedding. Those flowers skimming over the table in her sewing room becoming this dress that she took comfort in all day. She hears Suzanne say something about her guests and then the screen door slams and it is quiet in the garden. Olive touches her open palm to her cheeks, her mouth. She's going to have to go back into the living room before somebody finds her in here. She'll have to bend down and kiss the cheek of that bride who will be smiling and looking around with her know-it-all face. Oh, it hurts actually makes Olive groan as she sits on the bed. What does Suzanne know about a heart that aches so badly at times that a few months ago it almost gave out, gave up altogether? It is true, she doesn't exercise. Her cholesterol is sky high. But all that is only a good excuse, hiding how it is in her soul, really, that is wearing out. Her son came to her last Christmas time before any Dr. Sue was on the scene and told her what he sometimes thought about. Sometimes I just think about ending it all. An uncanny echo of Olive's father 39 years before, only that time newly married with disappointments of her own and pregnant too, but she hadn't known that part then. She said lightly, oh, father, we all have times when we feel blue. The wrong response, as it turned out. Olive, on the edge of the bed, leans her face into her hands. She can almost not remember the first decade of Christopher's life, although something she does remember and doesn't want to. She tried teaching him to play the piano and he wouldn't play the right notes. It was how scared he was of her that made her go all wacky, but she loved him. We would like to say this to Suzanne, 
She would like to say, listen, Dr. Sue, deep down, there is a thing inside me. And sometimes it swells up like the head of a squid and shoots blackness through me. I haven't wanted to be this way, but so help me, I have loved my son. It is true, she has. That is why she took him to the doctor this past Christmas, leaving Henry at home and sat in the waiting room while her heart pumped until he emerged, this grown man, her son, with a lightened countenance and a prescription for pills. All the way home, he talked to her about serotonin levels and genetic tendencies. It might have been the most she had ever heard him say at one time. Like her father, he is not given to talk. Down the hall now comes the sudden sound of clinking crystal. A toast to fidelity select, a man's voice calls out. Olive straightens up and runs her hand across the sun-warmed bureau top. It is the bureau that Christopher grew up with, and that stain from a jar of Vicks vapor rub is still there. Next to it now is a stack of folders with Dr. Sue's handwriting on them, and three black magic markers, too. Slowly, Olive slides open the top drawer of the bureau. Once a place for a boy's socks and t-shirts, the drawer is now filled with her daughter-in-law's underwear. Tumble together, slippery, lacy, colorful things. Olive tugs on a strap and out comes a shiny pale blue bra, small cupped and delicate. She turns it slowly in her thick hand, then balls it up and pokes it down into her roomy handbag. Her legs feel swollen, not good. She looks at the magic markers lying on the bureau next to Suzanne's folders. Miss Smarty, Olive thinks, reaching for a marker and uncapping it, smelling the schoolroom smell of it. Olive wants to smear the marker across the pale bedspread that this bride had brought with her. Looking around the invaded bedroom, she wants to mark every item brought in here over the last month. Olive walks to the closet, pulls open the door. The dresses there do make her feel violent, though. She wants to snatch them down, twist the expensive dark fabric of these small dresses hanging pompously on wooden hangers. And there are sweaters, different shades of brown and green, folded neatly in a plastic quilted hanging shelf. One of them near the bottom is actually beige. For God's sake, what's wrong with the little color? Olive's fingers shake because she's angry and because anyone, of course, could walk down the hall right now and stick his head through the open door. The beige sweater is thick, and this is good because it means the girl won't wear it until fall. Olive unfolds it quickly and smears a black line of magic marker down one arm. Then she holds the marker in her mouth and refolds the sweater hurriedly, folding it again and even again to get it as neat as it was at first. But she manages. You would never, opening the closet door, know that someone had passed through it. Everything's so neat. Except for the shoes. All over the floor of the closet, shoes are tossed and scattered. Olive chooses a dark scuffed loafer that looks as though it is worn frequently. In fact, Olive has often seen Suzanne wearing these loafers, having bagged a husband. Olive supposes she can now flop around in beaten up shoes. Bending over, scared for a moment that she won't get up, Olive pushes the loafer down inside her handbag. And then, hoisting herself, she does get up, panting slightly, and arranges the tinfoil-wrapped package of blueberry cake so that it covers the shoe. Are you all set? Henry is standing in the doorway, his face shiny and happy now that he's made the rounds, now that he's been the sort of man who has well-liked a doll. Much as she wants to tell him what she has heard, 
And much as she wants relief from the solitary burden of what she's done, she will not tell. You want to stop at Dunkin' Donuts on the way, Henry asks, his big ocean-colored eyes looking at her. He is an innocent. It's how he has learned to get through life. Oh, says Olive, I don't know if I need a donut, Henry. Well, that's all right. I just thought you said, okay, sure, let's stop. Olive tucks her handbag under her large arm, pressing it to her as she walks toward the door. It does not help much, but it does help some to know that at least there will be moments now when Suzanne will doubt herself. Calling out, Christopher, are you sure you haven't seen my shoe? Looking through the laundry, her underwear drawer, some anxiety will flutter through her. I must be losing my mind. I can't keep track of anything. And, my God, what happened to my sweater? And she would never know, would she? Because she would, who would mark a sweater, steal a bra, take one shoe? The sweater will be ruined and the shoe will be gone, along with the bra covered by used Kleenex and old sanitary napkins in the bathroom trash of Dunkin' Donuts, and then squashed into a dumpster the next day. As a matter of fact, there is no reason, if Dr. Sue is going to live near Olive, that Olive can't occasionally take a little bit of that, a little bit of this, just to keep the self-doubt alive. Give herself a little burst, because Christopher doesn't need to be living with a woman who thinks she knows everything. Nobody knows everything. They shouldn't think they do. Let's go, Olive says finally and she clutches her bag beneath her arm, preparing for a journey through the living room, picturing her heart, a big red muscle, banging away beneath her flowered dress. Well, <clears throat> Olive is not always that <laughs> mean. <laughs> She really has a heart of gold in some of the other chapters, but it's a balance, isn't it? And of course, it's such a perception. So much she dislikes her new daughter-in-law. Each chapter is really a different treat because you meet new people each time and somehow <laughs> Olive is woven into the pattern of that chapter. There are 13, as I mentioned, and uh, it's quite amazing. You, you keep reading, wondering when and why she's going to show up. <laughs> the chapters go with things like The Piano Player, A Little Burst, that was the one we read, Starving, A Different Road, Winter Concert, Tulips, Basket of Trips. Unfortunately, or fortunately, because of the greater richness of the book, uh, as 24 years pass in this book, and with that, of course, comes old age. And with that, of course, comes illness and passing. So even though this chapter was a tad bit humorous in thinking of Olive's reaction to the family, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it, uh, the book does get uh, quite sad in places, but it's so well-written, so well-written. Um, it's just got all, I, every one of us has got an aunt like that, I think I do anyway. Aunt Maxine, bless her soul. Um, so anyway, I think the book is grand um, and I would strongly suggest it uh, to you to read. Winner of the Pulitzer Prize, Elizabeth Strout, Olive Kittredge, Francis McDormand. <laughs> Let me take just a few moments to tell you about next week's book. We've had a few requests in comments section on YouTube uh, for travel. Uh, there are many people who seem to enjoy the travel books that we've read over time, either novels that bring us to another country or uh, A Journey with Bill Bryson, et cetera, et cetera, John Steinbeck's um, fabulous book with his dog. We're going to go to a, a wonderful place next week. Uh, and uh, the book uh, was published in 1838, believe it or not, by a Miss Julia Pardue. P-A-R-D-O-E, Pardo, perhaps. 
and it's called The Beauties of the Bosphorus. Now, the Bosphorus, of course, is the uh, channel of water that runs from the Black Sea. We do know where that is these days because of Ukraine. Um, and it runs directly down past Istanbul. As a matter of fact, it divides Istanbul uh, between the European side and the Asian side, and then continues down eventually to the Asian but has colorful history with Lord Byron and writers and et cetera. Lord Byron writes this, "'Tis a grand sight from off the giant's grave to watch the progress of those rolling seas between the Bosphorus as they lash and lave Europe and Asia." The British travel writer Julia S. H. Pardo 1806 to 1862, who suffering from consumption had been taken south early in her youth, accompanied her father to Constantinople in 1835 and was famous for her literary reports on Portugal and the Near East, even as a child. It's an absolutely fascinating section of the world uh, where you can sit on one side of the Bosphorus with a cup of tea and look across to Asia. And it is the only place on the planet where you can do that. I lived there and worked there for five years. So I know it ever so well with its incredible history and the 700 years of the Ottoman Empire. But um, so we're going to go there uh, back to 1838 and, uh, and travel around. Uh, and listen to the wisdom of uh, Lord Byron and also Miss Pardo. So I do hope you'll join me next week. I think it'll be quite interesting. The book is very old. It's an original. Uh, so uh, and I'll show it to you uh, next week as well. Uh, thank you so much for being with me today. If you enjoyed the video, uh, please uh, press that magic little icon with the thumbs up <laughs> just below you. Uh, maybe you might even consider sharing it with a friend if you have a friend who is familiar with all of Kittredge, probably. And also, please write a comment. Uh, we love getting comments uh, about the book, about uh, the writer, of course. Uh, maybe where Crosby's located. Hmm. Yes, Cook's Corner is mentioned at one point. So that puts us down Brunswick Way. Um, but I'm not sure. Maybe somebody said Cundy's Harbor, but I've not been there, so I don't know. But anyway, if you have a comment to write, please do. And also, if you have a favorite book that you'd like us to consider for a coming month, we'd love to hear from you with that. Just write in the comments section. And finally, I'd encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library's program's YouTube channel. It's another icon sitting there, a bigger one that says subscribe, uh, just so you can stay on top of all of the great programming at the library. It doesn't cost much, but it's a, a vote of confidence in us. <laughs> And by the way, we do still retain the number one spot in the state of Maine for the most subscribers to a program's YouTube channel. Every one of the libraries has one uh, across the state, including the big cities and the little towns. And we have been number one now for several months. So please press subscribe. We won't bother you with a whole lot of stuff in your mailbox. Don't worry. <laughs> Thanks again for being here today. I hope you read the book. It's just a lovely book. So please do read the book. Take care of yourself in the topsy-turvy weather. Winter has finally arrived um, and we're still uh, digging the ice out below the snow. Take care of yourself, most importantly, and stay healthy. Take care. Goodbye.